and a special welcome to the Shadow Mountain High School North Valley Arts Academy. Very happy to have you with us here tonight. Uh, we love working with all of you and uh, we hope you're going to enjoy this lecture and come back many times. And just remember, start thinking about your portfolio for when your graduate students, you want to apply here. <laughs> We're going to get you back here at some point. Uh, I also want to point out a few people in the audience, and in particular our two board members who are here tonight. So if you have serious problems or criticisms, you can always talk to them. <laughs> Max Underwood right there, and Eddie Jones. Wait, I saw Eddie Jones. Eddie Jones right there. Uh, and we have last week's lecturer, Will Bruder, and... <laughs> Next week's lecturer, Wendell Burnett, Wendell, Wendell, right there. So that also gives me the opportunity to say, don't forget, next week Wendell will be speaking. Uh, we are very proud to say that he is a graduate of the program. Um, and we can actually say that without lying. Uh, we claim other people, but. Uh, and he will be speaking back at the David Glass Wright House. So please join us uh, for that. Uh, I also want to. I must have said something wrong. I turned it off. Uh, that was Trump just tweeting that he's investigating you. Uh, James Abel uh, here from the Rio Salado Foundation. We're also very grateful. Which then also gives me a chance to thank the Rio Salado Architecture Foundation uh, as well as the Arizona Community Fund who have made uh, this lecture series possible. And we're very grateful for their continued support and look forward to working with them in many ways, both of them, uh, in the future. So very grateful to them. And then one last note, uh, which is that for those of you who think you're actually going to learn something useful tonight, uh, you can obtain your continuing ed education credit by making sure to sign in over there or sign out or whatever, sign. Just sign that you were here so that you can get your credit. So tonight we have with us uh, Marlon Blackwell. Now the last time that a really great architect came out of Arkansas, it was Ewan Faye Jones uh, who was sort of a product of this place. So we claim him as our own. And since Marlon is in some ways was mentored by uh, Faye Jones, we have decided that Marlon Blackwell is a grandson of the founder of this program and is part of our great tradition. So we are hereby officially claiming Mark Marlon Blackwell uh, to be part of the Taliesin community. Uh, now, truth be told, he actually is not a true son of the South. He actually was an army brat, so he was born all over the place. I trust since it was an army base, you could still be president someday. Good. Don't tell that to Trump. Right. So he still could be president, grew up as an army brat, wound back up in the south, went to Auburn, uh, went to the chilly north to Syracuse, uh, graduated from their program in Rome, and then moved in 1992 to uh, Fayetteville and wound up practicing there, living there, teaching there for the rest of his life. He has taught for many years at the University of Arkansas. He, in fact, ran the program at one point. And not many people get to say this. Not only did he teach there, does he teach there, not only did he run it, but he got to build a new building for it. Now, that's a pretty good deal if you're an architect, uh, as far as I'm concerned. But, of course, the main reason we know him is because he has been doing incredible work. Since 2000, when he founded uh, Marlon Blackwell, I guess it was architect and now it's architects, uh, in uh, Fayetteville, he has done work of extraordinary quality. What makes it even more extraordinary is that he builds with such sim seemingly simple means. The beauty of his work, I think, is the way that he uses the most basic materials and forms and then, and this is a very old-fashioned word, elevates them 
makes them into something more beautiful, grander, and more significant than you ever thought possible through simple processes of deformations, flips, elongations, and other ways of manipulating within the very narrow means of the building itself. And all of that means that I know no single architect who gets more bang out of a building than does Marlon Blackwell, FAIA. So here, representing and presenting some of the best work being done in the United States today and the proud traditions of this school, as well as the state of uh, Arkansas, please welcome Marlon Blackwell. Thank you, Aaron. Very nice introduction. Well, it's uh, great to be back. Is it, is it too loud? No? OK, great. Um, great to be back. Uh, I was here about uh, 10 years ago uh, in this very same room, as a matter of fact. And I have to say, the, the vibe here is really good, really good. And I, I really enjoyed my short time here uh, visiting uh, not only this place again and the students, but all my good friends here in uh, Phoenix as well. A wonderful design community. And uh, glad y'all, some of y'all showed up tonight, so that's great. <laughs> I was thought about bringing my mother, but make sure we had a full crowd. But uh. <laughs> So uh, well, let's dive right in, because I know we have a limited amount of time, and uh, we have all these wonderful high school students here as well, and I don't want to keep y'all up too late. Uh, so anyways, let's dive in. Uh, I always start uh, every, uh, every lecture off with this building, my favorite building in the world, known as the God Barn uh, in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And I, I, it's native to its own place, uh, had a singular purpose. Uh, and of course, over time, that purpose has sort of transitioned in some ways. Um, and it's, it's something that dealt with the specificities of its place, and yet at the same time now has a much more universal kind of dialogue you know, uh, with the world. And it's something that we've aspired to in our own little corner uh, of the world for a long time is, how do we situate uh, the universal and the local? Uh, how do we develop uh, an architecture that is at once of its place but has a global presence? Uh, that's something that is a productive tension uh, that we believe uh, creates a, a wonderful dialogue and a wonderful, uh, at least strange kind of uh, way of engaging uh, our, our folks, but also the folks that come visit is that uh, there are lessons learned uh, from our place, but also from other places that kind of come together here and, and in many ways with its, uh, its own message. So, you know, it's something that, uh, again, we hope to make a building this good one day. Um, now, Aaron was telling you a little bit about me. Uh, we are been operating in uh, Fayetteville now for the last uh, 25 years. This is our, our new office. Uh, we just took over an old failed bar and... Uh, trying to make it work. Um, it's true that I was born into a military family. I was born in Germany. I am from Alabama originally. Uh, and we lived, lived all over. Uh, and you know, one of the places I lived was near the Everglades, uh, south of Miami, Florida, and Homestead, Florida. And I grew up as a child with a real love of nature. And of course, living near the Everglades, I also developed a real fear of nature as well. Uh, so kind of a wonderful balance, counterbalance there. Uh, I, I had a desire initially, initially to be a cartoonist. And so I cartooned, it seemed like, my whole life, even all the way up into college, with my own cartoon strips, inventing characters and stories and such. And I, I thought was my original passion. I thought, God, I just want to be a cartoonist. But then I read an article someplace where, uh, you know, I, I read that uh, most cartoonists have alcohol problems of some sort. <laughs> so I, I thought, that's a terrible idea. Uh, I'd rather be an architect. Uh, so, uh, yeah, lots of issues there and alcohol being one of them. Um, so, you know, uh, I then thought, well, God, I'd really like to be an athlete. And I was not a very good athlete at anything except uh, wrestling. I was a pretty good wrestler. And in fact, when I lived in Colorado, our, our coach had this brilliant idea that 
uh, for practice one day, we would wrestle a live bear. Uh, and so at 110 pounds, I wrestled a 500-pound bear uh, that I soon discovered new wrestling moves. That's a, that's a real disaster. But uh, when you come to my office this, this day, I, I've always thought of that as, what, as a kind of existential challenge of having to you know, wrestle the bear, that, you know, that overwhelming thing. So you know, uh, payback's a bitch. Um, so when you, when you come in, you confront this every day. Um, uh, anyways, uh, it's, a, it's a dialogue we're having. Um, I came from a very modest family. Uh, in terms of you know economic background, a lot of kids and not a lot of money, and I had a real desire to be the first in my family to go to college, uh, and so the only way I could do it to go to Auburn was to pay for it essentially for myself. And so, uh, what I did for five summers to figure out how to pay for this is I was a Bible salesman in the rural South, and I worked in places that uh, many of us only read about, like Faulkner would write, write about or something. And you know, I was in place in in this beautiful landscape with these uh, wonderful culture and food. Uh, and, and, of course, the tradition of telling stories, uh, which any good Southerner will do, and, and, and so the love of, uh, of telling stories as well. And I met some really interesting people along the way. And uh, I met this guy right here as a, an outstanding Bible salesman uh, while he was uh, running for president. I know, 70s fashion, it's, that is actually me. It's been a lot of mileage. Um, it just shows you can survive 70s fashion. I, um, I heard it's still coming back around. That's, that's good. Uh, my students, when they saw this at Arkansas, they, uh, uh, they started calling me Dirk. Uh, uh, anyways, but uh, nonetheless, really interesting uh, experiences along the way that, that really helped shape uh, you know, who I am, how I kind of engage the world, how I interpret the world, interface with the world. When, uh, uh, whoops, what, did I do something wrong? Uh-oh, I lost an image. Well, that's unfortunate. Okay. Well, uh, what I was going to say, uh, when we did our monograph, we had uh, the uh, opportunity to do a, an image that was really kind of indicative of our place. And so I was going to show you an image of this uh, uh, in the Ozarks. Now, where I live in Fayetteville, every uh, city, most every place in northwest Arkansas is built in valleys and stuff, but Fayetteville is built on hills. And so you can actually stand in the downtown and see out into the countryside and see these beautiful valleys and uh, as well as like chicken houses and pastures and cows and stuff. And so I had this image. I'm going to try one more time. No, nope, it's not there. Wow, it just told, this is like the ghost in the machine here. Uh, so anyways, it's an intersection of a, a building on the hill, Old Main of our campus, which you know represented education and culture. And then we had agriculture. And if you can imagine, uh, and that there was a calf with the cow that we had there in this really nice juxtaposition. If you can imagine, just as we take the photo, a Walmart truck drives right through the middle of it. So we're also, uh, you know, uh, home of the Ozarks. We're also the capital uh, of Walmart, uh, you know, commerce, distribution. All of these things that kind of go together describe our place. And it's a place of real natural beauty and simultaneously one of real constructed ugliness. Uh, and, you know, there's lots of that around here as well, I noticed, uh, driving through Scottsdale today. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, words like abandonment, erasure, nostalgia, uh, exploitation, I mean, they're all aspects of this place. And what we've discovered is these conditions are no more real than the local form or expressive uh, uh, character that we find in our place. And so it's a place of real disparate conditions that has really become not just a setting for work, for our work, but really part of our work. Uh, so what we try to do is look at this as instead of like negatives, as instead of deep source of possibilities of indirect experience with the world as it's given to us in our efforts to retranslate it into the world as we'd like to see it. And, you know, what we're doing is working from a, a, a real uh, simple conviction is that architecture is larger than the subject of architecture. So what I try to do and what I try to encourage my students to do is look at the world with a wide-angle microscopic lens in which you can generate ideas and actions uh, from the everyday experience of the world as you find it, uh, between uh, your own history and the history of, your, of the discipline, between the ordinary and the extraordinary. Um, and uh, as a result, you have to be very careful observers, attentive 
observers of your place. You may recognize the building on the left. Uh, Aaron was talking about Ife Jones earlier, uh, a friend and mentor. This is his masterwork, uh, Thorn Crown Chapel, which in, is in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And I, we have brought architects from all walks of life to see this building. Uh, folks like uh, uh, Peter Zumthor and Jacques Kurtzog and Pierre Namiron and Peter Eisenman, uh, Glenn Merkett, uh, uh, Daniel Liebskin, a host of folks. And it's interesting that no matter what their sensibilities are, they all have this really great visceral experience when they visit this building. And so, uh, and why? Well, it's, it's architecture in many ways at, at its highest uh, level. Now, just across Eureka Springs is another icon uh, in the landscape. Uh, what we affectionately call Milk Carton Jesus. Now, <laughs> he's part of a uh, tourist uh, attraction called the Passion Play where uh, tourists come from around the country to watch the life of Christ acted out by actors uh, and you know, surrounded by plywood facsimiles of Jerusalem. Uh, and, but the idea of the central figure, of course, is, is uh, Jesus here. And the idea was they had designed him to be much, much taller, but as they were erecting him, getting ready to, they were informed by the FAA that he was so tall he would have to have a flashing blue light on the top of his head. So, uh, you know, they didn't want to do that. But rather than redesign him or anything, since they already had him, they just cut him off at the knees and shoved him back in the ground. And so he, he has this proportions of a milk carton. Anyways, so I just show you these two juxtapositions to illustrate to you the highs and lows of where I work. And again, <laughs> We don't see this as a, uh, you know, our task is trying to resolve one to the other, but again, see them as both uh, sources of possibilities. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is develop resonance between these conditions. And I think uh, ne ne necessarily then we have to be, like I say, very careful observers of both the, uh, the geological, the biological, and always the cultural uh, that has allowed us to develop a more inductive bottom-up process that allows us to amplify the small things that manifest the large things uh, in, in our working from the everyday. So uh, Leonardo da Vinci, I think, said it best when talking about creating from the everyday, when he said it should not be so hard for you to stop sometimes and look into the ashes of a fire or mud uh, or, 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 or clouds or like places in which you may find really marvelous ideas. So out of the muck of our own condition, that's what we're seeking, is really marvelous ideas. And so uh, what we've been doing for the last 25 years is working between the motivating forces of the everyday. And I think it's safe to say that most architecture isn't very good. And most good architecture is good enough for most days. But there are some buildings, some architecture, that needs to rise above the everyday. And this necessarily challenges us to return to the significance of the everyday and to enrich it and revalidate it through the totality of the things that we make. And so we are ba basically working um, in situations where the inadvertent meets the purposeful. And it's at once familiar and yet remote. Uh, in fact, we often see our task is really the task of recreating uh, strangeness of working between what we like to call the nature made uh, and the culture made and finding analogs and relationships between uh, these conditions and simultaneously being mindful that we work between the ideal in our discipline and also the more improvised and having the good sense not to see one as more uh, uh, desired over the other but seeing them as possibly in dialogue with each other. And as a result, what we've been able to do is look at what we find and find ways to represent it to the world, to reprogram it, resituate it, uh, to create a condition that's much more strangely familiar to the folks that we're building for. Again, to have that productive tension between the specificities of place and a kind of more universal global dialogue uh, with folks beyond. So uh, in this line of thinking, too, we've also been working on our own sort of meta project as well. And part of that is looking at the singular in places where there is more space than form. Uh, the power of the barn, the power of these silhouettes, these figures in the landscape, reductive figures with a high degree of expressive character. Basically, finding a way uh, to use an economy of means for a maximum of meaning. 
and I've learned this through the cartooning, through uh, developing most everything as a visage, uh, as a section, uh, and, and that's how we begin uh, the projects. Uh, and this is all, we have a whole text, and we have hundreds of these, but these are just some of the projects uh, that we are in the office or currently in the office or have been built. They're all part of this uh, uh, project, this meta project that we're in, in search of, uh, a language uh, for the singular. And we try to work typologically and, and as typologies uh, being understood as something adaptive, uh, evolutionary, dynamic, not fixed. Uh, not something that then becomes more about style. So we were asked to do a seven-story house in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, and we looked at our place, these beautiful chicken feed mills, and our own travels to places like Lucca, uh, the great tower in Italy, or places like Yemen. I had just come back from a trip to Yemen where many of the folks there live in these seven-story uh, mud brick and stone towers. And the s largest social space is at the very top, the Mufraj. And so we tried to think about how would we make a tower in our place. So we, we looked at the textures and patterns that nature had provided us, the strided bark of the, the oak trees there, uh, and, and then we milled these oak trees about 20 miles away. It's a renewable resource uh, and developed our own white oak uh, thin lattice system that begins to wrap a 50-foot high uh, stairway courtyard uh, in the base of the tower. It also establishes a datum for the mature height of our oak trees there. Our oaks don't get very big because uh, we, we have uh, our cash crop there is rocks. We have a lot of rocks, so the <laughs> soils aren't so good. Um, so that's, that's a mature oak right there. Um, so that was a strategy of how it meets the ground and how we engage that. And then simultaneously, we had to think about what happens when we hit the sky, bust above the canopy. Well, there's another whole order in that landscape we discovered of industrial and agricultural buildings, infrastructural buildings made of white concrete panels or white metal panels, and we wanted to be in dialogue with that other order. So we developed our own uh, metal panel system, uh, really seamless corners and such, very taut skin over the ribbed wood, and created our own system of articulation that was uh, particular to its place, connected to the specificity of the immediate site and then to the more expansive site beyond. And very simple materials, again, uh, steel, uh, local uh, creek stone, river rock, and pecan shells from southern Arkansas make up the floor. And so when you step from the outside to the inside and you sink into the floor, there's acoustical difference, uh, a kind of tactile difference that sets you up for the sequence uh, up the 99 steps to the top. These are our very fit clients right here and their baby. We have a dumb waiter for baby and beers, actually, in this one too. Uh, so you get to the top and there's a whole uh, observation room with a 360 degree view. It's all established so that the horizon, uh, which expands in all direction, is you know, right in the middle of the space, which is kind of cool. It's got a very Miesian. And then out of the ceiling falls a stair. Uh, you move up into a room with controlled views to the landscape, but the big view is in the oculus to the sky. And, and you sit out uh, under the stars, uh, under the cosmos, and it really becomes a pretty magic. You sleep out under that. Uh, and so it sets up all these different views, framed views, uh, 360 views, views to the sky. It's really about view and the act of viewing. And one of the amazing things is during the equinox, some cool things happen. I can deal with that in the Q&A session, though. So another small project, just starting out. Uh, I, when I was uh, a student, I had a, a really cool girlfriend, but she dumped me. Uh, and uh, she asked me to be her friend, uh, which I, I was... <laughs> somewhat offended by, but I thought, oh, well, why not? Well, a few years later, I got to design her mother's house. And so I just tell students that if you ever get dumped, consider the possibilities if they ask you a friend. Uh, so I didn't do my mother's house, but I got to do my ex-girlfriend's mother's house. So uh, Wonderful House Cashiers, North Carolina, was a record home. Uh, and about 10 years later, she came back to me. She had become a beekeeper. And she had a four colonies of bees out in the woods, a sour wood honey that she was... Uh, cultivating, and she needed a place to pull the, uh, you know, the honeycomb out and put it in a centrifuge and bottle the honey, sell it in the market or along the road. So we made for her a single space, eight foot by wide by 24 foot long, with one primary architectural element, a steel plate, quarter inch steel plate, and faceted glass wall, a load-bearing wall made primarily of voids that helped support everything and helped uh, organize the honey for display and storage uh, at the same time to act as a type of brisolet. Uh, to the south, 
and then through the folding of the glass we created deep pockets of space for insects and small birds to nest in and, and begin to allow the, the building to be imbued in many ways with what Wright would call the order of change. It's never the same in terms of how light hits it, how it has opacity, transparency, translucency built into it in terms of your vantage point to it, but always something different going on uh, in it. So uh, it was a really great lesson, a $40,000 project. Uh, it demonstrated that, you know, man, architecture can happen uh, on, on, and with the most modest of means. So as we were working towards this, uh, we had an opportunity to scale up to do our first uh, public building, as the owner described it, which was really a private clubhouse, a golf clubhouse uh, for uh, one of the Tysons. And, you know, Mr. Tyson said, you know, look, I want a clubhouse. I got a new golf course, but I, I don't want another uh, Terra or a hunting lodge, which they always seem to either look like a plantation home or a hunting lodge. I'm not sure what that's about. But in any event, he said, I want a modern uh, contemporary building of the 21st century that respects the rituals, the programmatic rituals uh, uh, of the golf clubhouse. So again, we made a very small footprint, very concise footprint made of our cash crop, local stone, uh, all dry stacked and quarried uh, in uh, Paris, Arkansas. And then we wrapped this tube of space on the second floor all in copper, timeless material, uh, wrapped all the program in that. And we, we were able to you know, put the, the standardized program in it, but with a few surprises as well, uh, things like a, a kind of Roman bath at the end, sky lit, and such. And of course, when this uh, was published in Art Daily, uh, somebody blogged on it and said, hey, uh, uh, Peter Zumthor called and would like his baths back. And I was like, oh, yeah, man, what's I channeling that? And, and, uh, and I was like, uh, well, it's like, you know, I was trying to rationalize it for myself. And about three hours later, somebody else blogged and said, yeah, and the Romans called Peter and they'd like their baths back. So, <laughs> anyway, it's all part of a continuum that, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing new, right, under the sun. But anyways, when we were asked to do this, I mean, I've always heard as, a, as, a, as an architect that we should be educating our clients. But the more and more I do this, I find my clients educate me. Uh, when Mr. Tyson asked to, to do this, I said, I don't know if I'm the right kind of person to do this. I can't golf. I don't know anything about golf. Uh, he seems like he wants more of an expert. He goes, this golf clubhouse isn't about golf, man. He said, it's about people and space. And I was like, yeah, well, I can do that. So, you know, there was a great kind of lesson right there. And, this has been a, a, a you know a, a really uh, evidence to ourselves that we could possibly scale up with some of our uh, uh, sensibility about architecture. So thinking of typologies as some, being something that's uh, rather uh, adaptable and evolutionary was really brought home uh, in a model home program post Katrina in the city of Biloxi. This is a, a partnership uh, between Oprah Winfrey's Angel Network and Autodesk, if you can imagine. Uh, quite an unholy union, but nonetheless, um, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, rethink the house in the new FEMA, uh, uh, time of FEMA, let's say, where every house, every structure now in the city limits has to be built uh, anywhere from 6 to 11 feet above the street level, uh, above, above uh, the uh, kind of uh, hurricane zone. And so uh, we thought about this, and we just started with the, local typology of the shotgun house. But we were thinking about the implications of raising the house uh, to, you know, the social fabric, to the urban fabric, you know, what that meant. And one of the things we knew that in the South especially, that the porch is very particular in its interface between the private world of the house and the public world of the street. It was very important to how folks interacted with each other. So we kept the porch on the ground. Uh, we elevated the building. We then stacked the program to make it more adaptable to a variety of uh, lot sizes, and that evolved into what we call uh, the porch dog house, which is a, a prototype at $135 a square foot that could build, be built pretty much anywhere, and it uh, resistant to a Category 4 uh, hurricane uh, storm surge, surge and winds. It's some steel in it, but it's mostly out of wood and concrete block uh, wrapped in a metal skin. It's a very simple strategies, these sliding uh, perforated metal shuttles, shutters uh, on the east and west that control the sun but they're also able to be locked in place. So this is like a secure lockbox. What happened to a lot of folks in Katrina uh, that didn't make it is they would not leave. They would wanted to stay with their possessions because they were afraid of looting uh, uh, after the hurricane. And so they stayed and uh, 
some of them didn't, like I say, didn't quite make it. In this case, you can secure it and leave for higher ground. But little simple things too, like this perforated stair from outside up into the inside of the building. So as the water rises, it rises through the stair rather than being forced up into the house itself. Uh, I, I love showing this. This is the Katrina cottage that the new urbanists came, came up with. And, you know, Biloxi was the only town in the Mississippi Gulf Coast that rejected, rejected the new urbanist plan uh, for, for, for the Gulf Coast. They decided that not everybody wants to live in Grandma's house with a geranium on the porch. And so this is what the new urbanists come up This is what happens when typologies become fixed. You make stuff like this. And the reality is in the next Category 4 storm, I know which structure will not be there. Uh, and, you know, it's the one on the left if you're not, not sure. <laughs> So this volatile condition, working between land and water, is something we uh, have also done several projects with. Uh, more recently, one for the Indianapolis Museum of Art uh, in Indianapolis, uh, a very uh, interesting project. It's a 100-acre uh, site-specific art and nature park that we worked with with Ed Blake, wonderful uh, architect, passed away from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and uh, Mary Miss, an environmental artist in New York. Uh, and it's a, a very kind of compelling site located right on the edge of Indianapolis on the city grid where it then gets more pastoral along the oxbow let's see how I'm doing here yeah along the oxbow right here of uh, the White River and there's a canal that runs through this black area is the uh, acreage of the uh, or the campus let's say of the Museum of Art uh, and at one time this piece of property was just pristine forest then it became a pasture for a farmer and then it was quarried, as you see going on here, to uh, pull out limestone uh, to make uh, the highway through the interstate through the middle of uh, Indianapolis. And then it filled up with water and became an amenity in the city. Uh, so it's, uh, the thing about this is, is because of indiscriminate development upriver, they've had three 100-year floods in the last eight years. Um, and what happens is the water rises above the lake and the river breaches over, as you see here, uh, and then floods the lake, scours the whole 100 acres, and then breaches back down river on the oxbow. So of the 100 acres we had to work with, uh, when you factor in the lake and the flood zones and the floodways and the uh, easements and everything, we had 0.67 acres to build on. And so very easy to find our site uh, where we're going to locate it. Uh, wow, I'm having a formatting problems here. Jesus, we should have checked this out before we, we pulled it up. So that's a site here with our site. Uh, something happened in the conversion. Hope this doesn't keep happening. Uh, so here's our site, uh, wet, uh, fecund. Here it is in the water. Th the challenge was we had to build five feet above the forest floor. Uh, and the question was, how do, how do we do that? You, you, it's right at your eye level. You don't want to see a building on stilts. So our, uh, uh, there's a whole set of uh, pathway journeys our landscape architect had developed. And we really just wanted to extend those journeys in a seamless way so that people of, uh, you know, universal design, uh, you know, uh, could access these paths, access the building uh, up to five feet. So uh, handicapped accessible ramps uh, extend the pathways, uh, and then the building, uh, you know, is elevated. So he came up with the idea of figured mounds underneath it would channel the water around it. And then these figures point to specific views cut out of the woods. Uh, and then it channels the water under it. So it's just a really kind of seamless way of elevating uh, the building. And then simultaneously, we, we wanted the building to be an extension of the pathways, pathway journeys, not just a, uh, you know, a destination. And we had been out on the site, and we had taken this photo. And when we got back to the studio, we're looking at it uh, and got to looking at it closer and found seven deer that we hadn't seen in that area. And we thought, what if we could make a building that sort of camouflages itself. So that's our building on the right. But as you get closer to it, it begins to reveal itself in particular ways. So this is it kind of coming up out of the mounds in a very sort of subtle way. And then as you get closer, it, it becomes this uh, wonderful uh, structure, canopy, wall, deck structure with an exoskeleton uh, that allows air and water uh, uh, and sun and light to come through it. And then it's pleated, the system is pleated uh, to create figured uh, water, figured light uh, through it, and more intensities of light. And part of this came from our own research looking at uh, the uh, microscopic images of a butterfly wing, uh, looking at these leaves. I kept finding these leaves on site 
that had been eaten away by insects. Very porous surface, but very strong with all the structure of the leaf left intact. So we began to ask that question, could we make a really strong building that allowed light, air, and water to come through it, much like the forest itself, ventilating uh, the air beneath. And so the interesting thing about this uh, exoskeleton, is you rarely see it. What you see is the shadow, and the shadow that constantly moves because the sun is moving. And so it pulsates with the rhythms uh, of the day and the seasons. And it's always very dynamic. These shadows are always moving. So it's, it's just like a, you're watching film. Uh, in a way, which is pretty fantastic. This was designed by uh, Guy Nordenson, a really great structural engineer that we work with out in New York. And to get it past the, uh, you know, the codes, we, we infilled in between with uh, one by two UV rated uh, acrylic bars that are side screwed into the EPE that's turned on edge uh, and, and creates a walking surface. And then we light it uh, uh, underneath and it be really becomes this kind of, uh, uh, oh, how, how do you say, uh, apparition in the woods, uh, so to speak. And just very simple, a glass vitrine for the lounge. This is a visitor center. You just come and you know, get out of the sun and relax for all the artwork and nature you're seeing. Just chill out. Uh, a black box of charred cedar that handles all the bathrooms and the kitchen and offices and such. And they just kind of come together very nicely. And then uh, this canopy that wraps the floor, wall, and canopy uh, over. It's like a taco in a way, right? And then a uh, water popped uh, uh, oak, ebonized oak, very, very fixed kind of finish, very permanent finish. But then we allow the wood to turn silver over time, and which is what it's done. So two kind of ideas of time that are working uh, uh, t together or in, in opposition really to each other. And so this is now all silver. This black box is permanent, and it just sort of melts uh, into the landscape, it recedes into that landscape, and then you know in hopes of getting on the cover of something. We have photos like these. Uh, <laughs> we did get on the cover of a book by the AIA with this. But this was the first uh, national AIA award winner uh, for the city of Indianapolis. And uh, it's one of the smallest buildings, 1,200 square foot building. So uh, you know, great things in small packages. So most recently, uh, we've just finished a project in Memphis uh, that we did with uh, Jim Corner Field Operations. Uh, worked on for uh, several years. Uh, Memphis is a very dear place for me. I think it's my favorite city in the South. Uh, this is the bridge from Arkansas to Memphis, and I just I love going across this bridge. Uh, and I love going down to uh, Beale Street and down to where really the birth of rock and roll. You you know you go to Sun Studio where they, you know Howlin' Wolf and Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash and Jerry Lee Lewis. All these folks uh, were discovered where they got their start. And in the 50s, it was the happening place. Um, now, on the other side of Memphis during the 50s, uh, there was another place as well. Uh, and it was a 4,500-acre penal farm. And, and the prisoners uh, cultivated this land and, and raised uh, uh, vegetables, and, and they raised cows and all of this to feed themselves as well as to sell uh, in the county as well to help sustain uh, the penitentiary, uh, kind of its own revenue uh, stream. And what happened is that form of rehabilitation fell out of favor in the 80s. And so the county took it over, but found it very hard to manage 4,500 acres uh, and cultivate it. So eventually it evolved into a nonprofit that took it over to make it a park. They wanted it a park for the city of Memphis, and it's on the, in East Memphis. Now, uh, just to give you an idea of scale, uh, that's uh, the downtown of Memphis in the red, and then on the right is Shelby Farms Park. And you'll see a lake in the middle of it, and that's called the heart of the park. So this not-for-profit, uh, it was a pretty good park, but you know, only a few, you know, certain class of people came there, and they wanted to kind of create more diversity, more equity in terms of people that would come there so that Memphis would claim it as their park, as their truly their park. But in order to sustain it, they needed revenue streams to keep it going. So the idea of it was to master plan it, but to really develop the heart in very specific ways. And this is what Jim Corner did, really developing this new lake in Edge, expanding the lake. And we were asked to do seven different buildings that would generate revenue. Uh, a visitor center, uh, a, a multi-purpose event center and restaurant, uh, a uh, stage pavilion, picnic shelters, as well as a boat kiosk. And so they had to be uh, configured and laid out around the edge of the park so it wasn't just the 
uh, the, the, the buildings themselves, but the spaces between that had to work together. And so uh, we thought about what we were finding in the park, and what we observed was that wherever there was shade, there was people. Uh, no shade, no people. You could be at a picnic table in the shade, no problem, packed with people. 20 feet away in the sun, no people. So we thought, well, maybe one of the things we could do is create these buildings that create their own shade so that they would be a, kind of these little epicenters to bring people around them. Uh, and so we, even when they weren't being used like as a stage pavilion, it could be a shade pavilion. So that was the thought, just a kind of porch language, an ensemble of buildings. And, you know, this is it today. Uh, it just kind of opened up uh, last year. Uh, but so it really activate, the, say, the core of this park. Now, what we looked at, we went back to origins, back to the vernaculars we often do. We really find that the vernacular is a great place to start. We don't necessarily like to end there at all, but we, a great place to start and find ways to transcend it. And we thought about the porch, and you know, which is the place which helped cool buildings before air conditioning came along, a place where people gathered. And in places like this dog trot, this breezeway, which generates, intensifies the wind and creates its own uh, cooling uh, effect. So we wanted to put those to use in our building. So the, the first building, the visitor center, is essentially an 8,000 square foot visitor center with an 8,000 square foot porch. Uh, and it's all uh, clad in uh, industrial uh, uh, bar, aluminum bar grate uh, as the system. And that porch is something we could program year round because it, it stays in the shade. But the problem with Memphis, you can be in the shade and uh, you know sweat like a pig because if there's no ventilation. So we put five 20 foot big ass fans to uh, help, co that's, the, that's the trademark, you can ask Eddie Jones on that. Uh, he, <laughs> He's got two of them on sticks in his, in his office but uh, to help ventilate. And so you can program it year-round. So, uh, and so the, uh, uh, we use second-growth cypress that we can get, renewable resource locally as well. This is a bosque of trees that people move through from the parking, and then they uh, get to these breezeways, and those transition as extended thresholds into this uh, landscape with this beautiful, unobstructed view, 30-something-foot cantilever, uh, uh, underneath the porch there. And it becomes uh, very activated. There's always people hanging out there. And then, uh, you know, it's also a different program, everything from yoga to just rocking in the chair. Uh, and you, here you can kind of see that layered sequence of the parking, the drop off through the bosque, uh, through the extended thresholds, and then out onto the porch. Uh, and it really becomes, uh, I think, an active uh, approach sequence, but has uh, given identity uh, as the nucleus of this park. And everything's programmed along that interface between outside and inside, all the educational rooms, uh, the gift shop here, which has its own kind of dialogue with the fans outside. And then at night, or even not night, in the morning, I think this is more of a morning shot, because of the aluminum is highly reflective, it reflects the temperature of the light. So it, too, is constantly in a state of, of change. And at night, uh, we have lights on the inside, and we light it up, and it becomes a lantern in the middle of the park, like a jellyfish. Uh, and so you can see it sitting and you move through these pastures. There's the stage pavilion here. And you make your way across the landscape, ways of interfacing on the lake. Uh, here's the boat kiosk, the same palette of materials. <coughs> we just used three materials, kind of zinc-like metal panels, uh, cypress, and the aluminum, aluminum bar grate. So you get your boat, uh, you go out underneath the, the porch with its shade, you rig your boat and get it out onto the lake. <coughs> Excuse me. Same thing with the, uh, the picnic pavilions we call the crickets. Uh, these are all things that can be rented out as well and are constantly, they have a backup month long wait period for these, but they're sprinkled around the park as well. And then the stage pavilion is basically for events on the lake as well as in the uh, amphitheater uh, and actually again as a shade pavilion uh, when it's not being used uh, as a stage pavilion. And then the big, the big building is the uh, uh, multi-purpose event space. They've had a shortage of, you know, uh, event space in Memphis, so this is now booked for a, a year and a half out, uh, and a restaurant right on the lake. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you've heard of Elon Musk, his brother Kimball Musk, uh, this is his restaurant. He's got uh, uh, three restaurants: farm-to-table restaurants in Ch uh, Denver, Boulder, Chicago, and this is his first ground-up one uh, on the lake in Memphis. And the thing about this is, again, the porch you have. Uh, yes, the cantilever from, on the event space, but you also have an 80-foot deep porch in the re restaurant area 
Uh, this is the approach to the kitchen, local stone from Arkansas. It, 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 it's the best stone is from Arkansas. Uh, kind of the entry, the light. Again, always thinking about approach in a kind of more dignified transition uh, into even mundane spaces like event spaces here. Uh, but lots of great natural light views. And then those dormer type or, or dividers actually are walls that can actually come down. And then the porch. There's actually more seats on the porch than there are on the inside. And it's three-month backup for sunset uh, dinners on the porch. So this has really become uh, a park that has diversified. Folks from all walks of life uh, come here. They come here during the day. They come here at night. Uh, and it really has become a park that Memphis now uh, claims as Memphis's park, the park of Memphis. There you go. So more rural kind of conditions that we've been in, that I've been showing park-like conditions. I want to kind of shift gears to another condition that I know you're all too familiar with here in Phoenix, which is that of the suburban condition. And, and certainly uh, the same holds true for where I'm at. In fact, uh, much of the suburban condition where I'm at used to be uh, agriculture, farms that have been annexed and then developed into gated communities and office parks and such. And this is really uh, kind of characterizes what we're dealing with here. And you know, this powerful singularity uh, of, the, uh, of these figures in the landscape that really spoke of a kind of another time, not just in a nostalgic way, but in a, in, in, in to the pastoral uh, kind of and picturesque kind of condition of our landscape has now been taken over by banal sort of office buildings, uh, strip malls, uh, you know, really ersatz uh, uh, kind of commercial buildings and that sort of thing. Well, we could see that as a negative, but what we decided to do is see it, okay, well, what can we do with this? How would we operate in this? How can we use it both to be critical and instrumental and to be useful? So we had an opportunity to do a pediatric clinic for kids that uh, don't feel too well, they're sick, but also it works in developmental ways, mental health and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and put it, the doctor wanted it right in the middle of the suburban. He got a cheap piece of land and there were other medical uh, buildings around. And he wanted a two-story uh, building and that was it. And he, he liked art. That, that, was, that was his thing. So we thought, well, what would happen, uh, you know, one of the things we noticed about, I was talking with the students earlier today, if you look at suburbia where I'm at, you know, it's like every building is shouting for, you know, with every other building. And, you know, you walk up, you know, to the building and you count like 16 different materials before you get to the front door. And, or you might count like 24 different gymnastics, formal moves. And, you know, if you count that, there's, there's something wrong. I mean, there's fundamentally something not good. Uh, so we decided that what if we made a building out of one material and two colors, one figure, done just kind of like the old barns. And so you can pick out our building in there. It's that red thing there. And it's really caused a stir uh, in this context that we're in. And it's now known as the WTF building uh, here. <laughs> and these are all the adventures in uh, suburban architecture where we're at on the lower. And I thought, well, maybe our opportunity is to create a new species uh, of, of building that would be responsive uh, not only to its suburban condition in the car, but also to folks that are coming there uh, to use it, especially folks that aren't feeling too well. Again, we looked at things typologically. You see on your left, uh, things we really like, the billboard and the grain elevator and silo and barn. And then on the right, you know, the scrambled egg parties uh, of, the, of the, uh, uh, the, the strip malls and their Tourette's and all that. Uh, they we'll call it the Tourette syndrome that they, they seem to have. So, we combine those two things, and again, in a, a kind of uh, unholy union to make our building uh, here, this singular figure. And so uh, it's, uh, it has uh, bioswales all through it, so all the water from the, uh, uh, the parking lot is channeled into the bioswales and, uh, and held onto the site and reused. And then uh, this uh, uh, one material, a, a custom orange-red material, cayenne red, we call it, uh, it has a, its uh, own private uh, uh, entrance for the staff uh, at Port Cachere where uh, the children are dropped off and then brought into a lobby and then they ascend up here, the more public entry into the reception of above. And this here uh, is a lounge for doctors in between surgeries and calls. So they kind of chill out there and then before they're called down. And as you're driving by at 40 uh, miles an hour, uh, supposedly, uh, the, what you see is, you know, you get the red all to the south, the Brisolet to the east, that helps with the sun. Get a little closer, and you keep going by, and then you pass it. 
boom. And suddenly, you notice that everything to the north is completely different. And so it really sees itself as both uh, a signifier, right, and, and, uh, and a sign at the same time. Uh, and so it's got a split personality. Uh, and, and really thinking about itself in the suburban condition, kind of recalling the, the idea of the billboard. Uh, and then porch on the back side for the staff, they have uh, a kind of place to, to, to be. You dropped off under the port cashier, kind of very dignified way. Small lobby and sculpture and uh, plants. But what we thought would be interesting is to have uh, a little bit of wonder for the kids. So we flooded uh, the stairway with blue glass that drops a blue light that you ascend uh, up and through. So that's not paint, that's just blue light. Uh, and it intensifies over the course of the day. Uh, so it, again, always that idea of the order of change. Uh, and this is kind of that, that different sort of gasket of blue light as you move through. And so that's, again, an extended threshold that you come up through. Uh, you can see the diagram. So you move up and through. Uh, you do check in. This is your uh, reception area. If you've ever been a pediatric clinic, I've got kids. I mean, it's complete chaos half the time. You get in there, and they're screaming and yelling, and then there's a dinosaur crashing through the wall, and there's just crazy crap going on, TVs blaring and all that. We went right the opposite. Something was very calm and chill. And it's amazing. When you go in there, it's just like, ooh, very, very zen. They come up to staff, up the back here. They have their own area, and then they overlap. And so there's a circulation. You get called in, exam rooms here, nurses stations, flip around exam rooms. You pay uh, here, and you go back down the steps without ever uh, having to cross back over. Uh, so that's, that's the lobby area with beautiful views out to the interstate. Uh, and just a simple reception desk. Nice blue light there. Uh, all of the, uh, when you saw the blank wall, what that was about is no windows in the exam rooms, but they're all skylit from above. So there's all natural light in every exam room. And then even natural light, too, from above for the nurses and the nurses' stations. So there's getting nice quality of light. Uh, again, that figure that you see here in the private entrance and the bioswales. Uh, uh, and this is the, the lounge for the doctors. Uh, and then a nice sunset here. So again, asking the question, how might it be otherwise? And attempting, as I think many of us need to do uh, in the profession, is offer alternative models uh, to the reality that often blinds us to other possibilities. And, and that's what we're attempting to do here. So uh, one of the things I, I think is important, and especially for the students here, is to see a little bit a process of how you think, how you go through a transformational process of thinking. Uh, from the scale of the world to something quite the scale of the hand. Uh, we had the opportunity to do a retail store in a museum, uh, the uh, Crystal Bridges Museum. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's the most significant American art museum since the Whitney, designed by Moshe Softy. And right in the middle of construction, they came to us. Uh, we had to compete, but we won this project to do a museum store, that uh, a retail store that would be an extension of the museum experience. And uh, this is the, the museum from above. Uh, downtown Bentonville Square. There's a creek here. They dammed part of the creek and created a, this lagoon where bridges and galleries kind of work along the edge and then cross over and create this loop uh, of uh, galleries and a whole campus. It's really quite uh, wonderful, at least from a conceptual standpoint. Now, here's the orange crescent uh, that we were given, the uh, uh, white box, they call it. This is the, the worst concrete in the whole project. is architectural concrete, but this was the worst. Had poles or columns every 10 feet to support a green roof up above. I mean, western sun, I mean, it's like, when I looked at the space, all I could think of was, well, thank you, Moshe, thank you, appreciate that. Um, <laughs> so, but what we were thinking about is the material culture. 60% of Arkansas is forested with hardwood, mostly hardwood forest. So how we could transform that, not unlike uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Jones did in Thorn Crown, taking a very simple material, one-dimensional uh, piece of wood and a simple detail and repeating it ad nauseum to build energy, to store energy, to create a system of articulation that was powerful and, and very simple. Uh, so what we did is develop this store uh, using local cherry uh, plywood and walnut, but it's completely digitally fabricated. So everything is, has been uh, fabricated on a three-axis CNC machine. And we did that because every one of these ribs is custom. And so we were able to save 40% over doing it by hand. All the furniture and everything is also CNC uh, uh, fabricated. And so 
a really a, a way of thinking how to take material culture into something quite specific. And we were inspired by this man here, Leon Niehaus, who's a local and nationally known basket maker from Huntsville, Arkansas, who was going to be featured in the store. And we went to a studio and we noticed that he, he drew every basket with charcoal on newsprint in profile, man after my own heart. And, uh, and then he drew the plans at like a path. He would draw the plans. And then as it closed in on itself, uh, he would always create a kind of flourish. And you could see it in the basket. And it would give it its particular identity, its elegance. And so this action uh, of profile and path, this operation we thought would be very useful. So some of my early sketches with that in mind uh, really we looked at how I could develop a profile to solve some of the problems inside uh, and then extrude it along the curved path of the room. So this uh, little uh, buffer here or sun uh, uh, catcher baffle, what I like to call it, cuts down 40% of the sun, uh, configuring it, reconfiguring the space, covers up all the infrastructural sprinklers, duct work, light work, so we can control that and then creates an interstitial space where we can bury uh, the storage and the merchandise. So, and then these became ribs, uh, 286 ribs out of 430 sheets of cherry plywood, all optimized on an optimizer to minimize waste. And there's two or three pieces per rib, all hung from wires uh, attached to the concrete roof. Uh, and then that creates this figure, and light is baffled through, and it becomes a very uh, dynamic extension of the museum experience uh, of Crystal Bridges. Uh, these are all the different ribs here, all laid out from our BIM machine. So we went right from the BIM machine to the CNC uh, cutting, so really cut down uh, on shop drawings there. Uh, these are the shop drawings, essentially. That's Andy. Andy makes uh, newel posts and stairs on most days, but for uh, three weeks he made these uh, beautiful pieces for all the ribs, had them all numbered, made all the connections, and then we had these two old guys hang them over a period of four weeks, and when they finished they were so proud, and then they turned to us and said, hey man, be sure and lose our phone number next time. We, you, don't call us, we'll call you. So they, uh, so anyways, very tedious they said to do this. But you get the sense of what we're trying to do. And you know, if you, uh, one thing I'll tell students in particular, if you want to be a really good architect, you have to learn how to uh, be a really good at post-rationalization. Uh, so uh, one day one of the guys in the office was looking at the project and said, man, that, that reminds me of the underside of a mushroom, a lamella. So we just started calling it the lamella and we made these diagrams and all this, but all this is after the fact. Uh, <laughs> So I, we're really good at that. So here we are again, uh, just some parting images. We even made all the cash wrap and the furniture and all of that all floats above the floor. So you get this, again, back to the taco thing. And just really building in, in seamless ways, the transitions and details from horizontal to vertical. Now, the nice thing about this is that this store paid for itself in four months with its profits. So we were able to demonstrate to the owner that good design can be good business. And as a result, we've gotten a lot more business from this particular uh, client. Now, just a kind of quick break or segue into this last half of this, uh, and it's not a half, it's on a couple projects, uh, that I want to share with you. Uh, we were talking today a little bit about repurposing or sustainable practices through the repurposing of what we already have, which I think is probably the most sustainable thing you can do. Uh, there are a lot of uh, towns in my part of the world, in Arkansas and such, that have become more secondhand, that have uh, buildings that are underutilized or not used at all. And that when they build, they build on the edge of town in these metal buildings and such. There's a kind of lack of, of civic and economic will. And so we've been rethinking that, you know, we should do everything we can to repurpose what we have. And the story, the analog here to this, uh, took place in the late 40s, early 50s in Fayetteville. If you've heard of Senator William J. Fulbright, Fulbright Scholarships, he was from Fayetteville, Arkansas, and his family owned a lumber mill. And uh, they used white oak to make uh, plowshares, axe handles, wagon wheels, a variety of farm implements. And after the war, they were building up an inventory because uh, fewer and fewer people were uh, needing these, and they were being mass-produced elsewhere. And so he went to a friend of his, a, a very well-known architect from Fayetteville, Arkansas, who was doing the first fine arts complex in the country on the University of Arkansas campus. His name was Edward Durrell Stone. And he asked, they were friends, childhood friends, and he, so he asked Mr. Stone, I've got all this inventory. Do you have any idea what we might could do with it? And he said, you know, after a few days of thinking, he said, you know what we could do? We could make a whole line 
uh, an international line of furniture to populate my new fine arts complex and sell uh, at the international level. So that's what they did. Uh, they took these uh, plow handles and they turned them into uh, chairs. Uh, they took wagon wheels and turned them into uh, uh, these stools. Uh, they took the tradition in the Ozarks of basket maving, stripped the white oak from the trees to make these uh, rattan chairs with giant plowshare handles and then new legs to make these beautiful chase lounges. And what's amazing is they used up all the inventory that they had to create this line of furniture. And today, I, in fact, uh, I was in this uh, museum a year ago at the, at the, uh, at the uh, uh, Cooper Hewitt. This chair, not this particular one, but this chair, one of these chairs, is in the Cooper Hewitt Museum as, as a kind of uh, a, a true American art form. And so the impact wasn't just local, but well beyond. And so the idea of repurposing, I think, is, is something that uh, was really driven home here, and I think it's informed a lot of our projects. Uh, Aaron was talking about the architecture school. I was a department head and got the commission, uh, my firm and another firm, Pope Stanley Wilcox, to renovate uh, a 1930s library that we had been in for 40 years, uh, architecture school, and then add a 35,000 square feet to it, so a 100,000 square foot project. And the only caveat the, the university had was that the addition to the west here had to be the same width and length uh, as the east wing. And of course, uh, there were uh, quite a few people on the faculty who felt like, well, hey, why don't we just reproduce that and put it on the other side, kind of, you know, bookend it. And I said, yeah, but, you know, we're not in order dame. You know, that would be like anathema uh, to the program and so forth. So uh, we, we couldn't get all our, like, landscape architecture, interior design, all that under one roof. So that was part of the purpose of renovating and adding to it. So what we did instead is kept it the same length and width, but went back to the original quarries uh, where the limestone was quarried for this building and quarried limestone, but sent it to Texas to make limestone rain screen panels, whole new technologies. We used post-tension concrete. We got the concrete consultant for Tadeo Ando, who did the Pulitzer, to write all our specifications. So we, we wanted to create a, a heavy counterweight to this masonry limestone building on this side. Uh, and then uh, steel and glass, custom steel and glass that was made locally by separating warranties uh, uh, between the glass and the steel fabricators. And, and again, uh, developing a very uh, a, a building that might resonate with the old and really kind of uh, give the past a future here. And looking carefully at the proportion and scale and the things that inform the articulation of the existing uh, to develop our own system of articulation uh, that was complementary. So we begin to share the DNA uh, uh, here, the, the old DNA with the new DNA, and so how it might evolve in the 21st century. Uh, and to deal with this, you're in the middle of campus, right? And how do you stage materials and all of that stuff? So we came up with an idea of coring out the middle of the building here and creating uh, a staging area that we could work all of this building first and then work our way out of it, reprogram this, make our addition here. One crane to do that saved multiple, well, millions of dollars actually uh, in access fees and staging fees and, and working in a very impacted site. Uh, and then uh, the other thing in which we had to deal with was a, a 200 foot long western elevation, how to control that uh, western light. So we developed again a custom steel and glass uh, brisole, all fritted glass fins that all kind of angle back to the north, balance the light out, and then of course obscure this building here, which you don't really see. It's the ugliest building on campus. We call it uh, Albert Spear comes to Arkansas. <laughs> so, uh, so here's this uh, simple uh, figure, uh, elevation. Uh, we reprogrammed all the ground floor with all the public uh, aspects uh, of the program. This is a new uh, gallery uh, that we didn't have before. Uh, we have a now uh, a uh, we have an axis that goes through the campus, through the old main, the oldest building on campus, all the way through our building. Used to could never go all the way through because we had it was a reference library, so it had it was mostly books here. So you had to go around and through the library, the new library, through the Union Plaza, through the Union, all the way to Mecca, uh, which was the football stadium right here. It's not Mecca anymore, man. We're not doing so well. But uh, so we have our uh, plaza, a little shade plaza we did, and a new western entrance here. Really opens up. So what we've been able to do is reconnect our building, our community, with the larger university community. It's a, it's a throughway through there. We had two 100-year-old oak trees we had to pull down, so we lumbered them in southern Arkansas, 
and then had a, a very well-known uh, wood maker make uh, this uh, tableau, 25 foot long, 5 foot wide, tells the story of the trees. It's got face grain, it's got end grain, it's got long grain on the sides. It's a didactic teaching tool. In fact, the whole building becomes a way of teaching how we used to build and how we build today through new technologies, new ways of thinking about space. Complements these vitrines. This acts as a stage. We've had Shakespearean actors, mariachi bands. We had an exhibit from the Cooper here, here and people just hang out on it. Uh, and uh, really nice vitrines here we call the centipedes. And these also act as lanterns that light up the old preserved space, renovated spaces, so we don't have to cut into them. Uh, and then our gallery with movable uh, rotating uh, walls to control the western sun. Our first exhibit was a retrospective, Faye Jones. And then we light it up at night like a lantern. You go to most architecture schools that are on campus, they, they're lit 24-7, but they're hermetically sealed. You don't know what goes in there. It's like it's an insane asylum, something out of The Shining or whatever. And so we wanted to open that up, make it a lantern, make it a kind of uh, uh, create an atmosphere of hope in there, and then, uh, of course, uh, let let folks see what's going on, let folks see what's going on outside as well. And then we worked for weeks on this complex diagram to show you all the places that are restored, those that are renovated, and those that are new, and how they had to come together to create, again, a resonant condition on the interior where it's not jarring, where it just kind of uh, transitions very effortlessly one space to another. And lots of restoration and renovation going on in very, uh, I think, uh, smart, intelligent ways that don't overdo it just because it's old doesn't make it good. And we took the old reading room, becomes a studio. We used the wainscot to create the datum for the new uh, desk, custom desks that all have uh, embedded uh, LED lamps and then custom chandeliers up above, 50-foot candles above, 50-foot candles on the desk, just like the reading lamps uh, they had before in the library with the big chandeliers above. The new develops out of the old the old, however, is changed in the light of the new. And this is where they come together. The DNA of both become shared and they become understood in new and different and wonderful ways. One of the most difficult spaces are uh, large gallery, uh, reference room, what it used to be the reference room of the library. Poor acoustics, poor lighting. We blew the roof off the sucker, like we like to say. Uh, programmed it with studios up above. Stretched a 2,500 square foot uh, a fabric ceiling, backlit it to get even lighting. It's a perforated ceiling, so it helped resolve most of the acoustic issues. And then we uh, uh, kind of inserted that. Uh, it makes it have all these uh, panels that can be moved where we do our reviews. They can be all be uh, moved off to storage. So it becomes a multi-purpose event space. This is what we started with, and this is what we wound it up with. And then we cut a slot. We actually knocked this wall down and rebuilt it to historic uh, specifications, but this one slot, a five foot deep, uh, half inch piece of steel that wraps around, creates the, again, the threshold in, but allows all these panels to be slipped into storage areas. And you get a kind of nice resonance with what we call the retoculus, which is the oculus. Uh, eight foot wide, 20 foot long piece of glass, one piece of glass, window to the sky, so we have nature that comes right into the middle of the building. And then you can go up, I tell students go up and look in the red glass up here, and Studios, don't have another Red Bull if you've been up for a few nights. Just stare into here, get a buzz, and get back to work. <laughs> so uh, the joint between the old and new is a formal joint, uh, which is our new uh, stairs, uh, uh, access stairs. Uh, we use a deluge system, so we save millions of dollars on the, uh, on the uh, glass. It doesn't have to be fire-rated glass. Uh, nice pin-up spaces, social spaces, integral benches. These panels slide, and we have decentralized plotting all throughout the building. The studio is all nice, raw uh, architectural concrete, uh, shear walls, really tough, balanced out light uh, between the Briseolet on the other side, 50 foot wide space. Several classrooms, uh, 200 seat auditorium. Uh, we use a split screen system so we could get extra space for the faculty lounge where we go up and gossip about the students. Uh, however, not to be outdid, the students have their own lounge underneath the rake of the stairs, all wrapped in felt and beanbag chairs. and. It's just a kind of, we call it the boneless chicken ranch. And uh, uh, they also have showers next door that they can shower. And, you know, it just smells a lot better in this building. Um, <laughs> the only problem we had is that for the first semester, we had two students that were living rent-free uh, in the building. So we had to, to kind of change that, uh, fix that a little bit. So here we are, lots of natural light, or we can close that off in the studio. 
up above, green roof, faculty offices, seminar rooms, uh, really monk-like spaces, seven foot wide by uh, 16 foot long uh, faculty offices. And then a nice covered uh, classroom, uh, a place of refuge and prospect overlooking the, uh, the Boston Mountains. And we have, uh, this is where the students take their lunch and they also uh, have a movie series in here and, and such. Uh, and then you can see the whole generation here, the oldest building on campus, the next generation, and the next generation, all in dialogue with each other. Uh, again, all primarily through proportion, scale, and material. So the idea of secondhand towns and so forth has never been more true than in the town of Gentry, Arkansas. A town of 2,500 people has one industry, a Little Debbie snack food plant, uh, and uh, great oatmeal cream cakes. I'm sure you've had those and a wild country safari zoo where you drive through the landscape and emus and monkeys chase you as you throw Wonder Bread out the car. That's it. That's all they got. And, but they had a dream of having their own public library. They had one, but it was privately funded. So they wanted a public library, and they wanted it on Main Street, not on the edge of town. So they uh, bought a 100-year-old hardware store that had not been used for several years uh, that had, uh, was right on the corner of Main Street. And uh, this was it. And this is a picture I took on my first time coming to see it. Uh, and they said, you know, we want, uh, we want a, a library here. We want a community room. We want an upstairs genealogy department with exhibits from our city's history that we can show and all of that. And I said, well, that's great. I said, I think the best thing you could do with a building like this, because it's not architecturally significant, let's tear it down, start over, and it'll probably be even much cheaper. And, you know, it's like I poured boiling oil on them or something. They, it's like, they were very offended. And, they said, you don't get it. I mean, this was the socio-economic hub of our city for nearly 100 years. This is the head of the library board. And the mayor was with him. And he goes, yeah, when I was a kid, I used to eat barbecued beaver right out of the storefront here, uh, which is to show you we'll eat anything in Arkansas. Uh, so I, I got it. But they said, look, we don't want a false history. I mean, we want a new identity. I mean, what, what could you do? And I mean, this is a tough building. It, it, in Sin Tornado Alley, had been hit by storms. They just replaced it with the brick they had. Every window was blown out practically. And you know, I spent two weeks working in my studio, tons of yellow trash, sketching over and over, a little bourbon, a cigar occasionally, but highly frustrated most of the time. I couldn't come up with anything. And I finally came to the conclusion that maybe the best thing we could do is relatively nothing at all, uh, which, in other words, is take the building on its own terms, the ticks and wrinkles that it had achieved over this hundred years, see that as expressive character, just like you look into the face of your, uh, of your mother, your grandmother, and you see all this you know, time uh, creased into the face, and it's very, uh, it's very beautiful. And so we thought, let's come up with a, maybe a series of details to elevate the building, to reframe it and represent it uh, to the public. So we came up with a series of details called soap bubble details, our kind of little homage to Franco uh, Albini. So rather than place the glass, we decided to leave the building as a ruin. This was it when it was being built, very modest then. And all new columns, windows, doors, everything custom, uh, just to kind of create a whole new expressive character through uh, a syntax of details and elements, doors, windows, columns, and such. And this is it today. And this is still the least expensive library built, public library in Arkansas. We built this for $108 a square foot. Uh, it took seven years from the time of conception to realization. It was a, quite an adventure. And part of that adventure was working with this guy. This is the mayor. It's a real tough town. <laughs> and his name is Wes Hogue, and he owns a tattoo parlor. Uh, but one of the best politicians I've ever, I wish he would have ran for president, I've got to tell you. Uh, but this guy helped us get through all the small town politics and stuff for seven years. We worked at this. He helped get a millage passed in uh, a town that never had passed a millage. Uh, for 10 years to, to help raise money. He got money from the Little Debbie snack food family, gave a quarter of a million dollars. I mean, little bits here and there to make this happen. They had a dream, right? And so uh, very simple. That's the reading areas and the stacks, the community room, the Little Debbie snack food park, pocket park, little plaza in the back in the future home of uh, their uh, antique fire truck. Up top, uh, the library, librarian's office, the genealogy, and a variety of exhibits. And we made this little drawing, the chassis of the building, the brick building, and then the whole kit of parts like a Chilton car, carburetor manual, even down to this new beacon, again, a new symbol of hope right over the old skylight hole. And then we landed up at night, 
beautiful lantern. Again, very simple. New parapet on the top out of steel to replace the old brick one. And we just, this is glass that is on the f structural sealant on the steel fins. So we built wood forms in reverse to hold it in place, let it cure for 28 days, pull it out, and it just creates this very soap bubble-esque uh, interface between the street, it's all facing north, and the, uh, the building. Uh, these are, this pressed tin ceiling we couldn't touch or deal with in terms of punching holes, lights in it or such. So the, uh, the mayor had county prisoners come in and pull the tiles down and number them. They were restored off site, brought back. We just blew in the air from the side and then we had to replace the columns here. So we did, I've always wanted to do Mesian columns, so we did Mesian columns, wrapped them in wood, wrapped them in glass, uh, hit light in the bottom, bounce off, uh, creates a reflected light in the space locally. Uh, made furniture, Arkansas white oak. Uh, the old uh, mechanical lift that used to take down buggies, hook up to the horses on the street, is uh, uh, here becomes an exhibit. And there's a host of exhibits throughout uh, the building on the city's history. The librarian's office here restored hardwood pine floors. She's all alone, and I, I talked to her about that, but she confessed to me in private that she really hated people, but she liked books. Uh, so <laughs> she's, she's all alone there. And just simple things like this, taking an old existing opening and just rethinking about how we bend light uh, into the inside through these light boxes, captures the north light and bends it in, and offers perhaps a sacred moment in a prosaic condition. And, you know, the, the building has won you know, multiple national awards and uh, been published and all that good stuff that you always hope for in a building. But more importantly for us is that uh, when we started this project, there were 300 library card holders in this town of 2,500. Today, there are over 2,300 library card holders in this town of 2,500. So it underscores uh, the transformative power of architecture to strengthen institutions and be a, an agent of change uh, in the city. So in that line of thing, I'd like to end with this project here. Uh, is a, a small project we did uh, for an Eastern Orthodox uh, uh, community, uh, Christian, Eastern Orthodox Christian community who are worshiping uh, in a rundown office building in Springdale, Arkansas. And, and this is all trailer paneling and, you know, uh, acoustical tile ceiling. And, you know, they worship in a very aestheticized way with uh, icons and colors and everything means something in the in form of worship. And they felt it was very undignified. And they had a, a member of their congregation who died and left them their inheritance and inheritance. And so with that money, they bought three and a half acres here right up against the city park, right along the interstate along these mega churches here. We have lots of those, lots of uh, churches. And uh, they had money left over from buying the land, and they said, look, we've got $100 a square foot we can spend on, on a church, and we wondered if you could build this for us uh, here. And uh, we're like, uh, well, yeah, if it's made out of cardboard or something. Uh, no, and I said, I can't do that. We don't have that kind of money. And I said, you know, I want you to remember, these are adventures in religious architecture where I live here and where you live. Metal buildings with crosses hung on them. That's so, you know, God is not hanging out there. I just, I got to tell you. <laughs> and, you know, I grew up Southern Baptist. I get that. You know, you can worship. But that would just not work for them. I mean, look, you pull up on Sunday morning, and there are people with SUVs and cars that cost more than the building. I mean, and w would you live in one of these? Probably not. Why would you worship in them? I mean, these are just debates and conversations we could have. But the bottom line, I said, we don't want to go there. Well, they said, yeah, okay, that's cool. We get it. We get it. But look, we got $100 a square foot. So instead, what could you do with this? And I said, well, what is that? And he said, well, it's a welding shop. And I said, okay, well, you want to tear it down? We build on the foundations? I'm like, no, no, we want you to keep it because we only got $100 a square foot. And we want a sanctuary and a fellowship hall. What do you think? And I was like, and I thought myself, I would like to think it was Thorn Crown Chapel and, and we get this, you know. And, uh, you know, I thought about, you know, you think about, different forms of suicide and stuff. So, <laughs> so I was like, well, okay, our heart's sunk, and we're like, okay, well, we'll try to figure this out. So we went back to Origins, and I was like, well, how are we going to pull this off? And, well, it's Greek Orthodox, and we thought, well, what if we just used the Greek system in the early churches, which they used in Greek proportioning systems, stuff to reproportion the whole thing, rescale it. And so that's what we did. And, and holy cow, all right, you can't tell me this is happening. Come on now. Well, that, that's terrible. I can't believe it did that. 
No, nah, we're not going to do it. We're going to have to keep moving. Sorry. So this beautiful church. So here it is. Here's the facade of the church, all Reaper Persian Greek. Uh, and what, what we did is we reskinned it here. The existing building is still in there. Uh, we rewrapped it. We added 10 feet to the front of it. And uh, this is a narthex that moves north-south that gets us on the east-west here into the sanctuary fellowship hall and then rolling uh, walls on wheels open up for overflow services. And so it's, uh, it's very simple. Uh, and here it is. There You can kind of see it there. So we, uh, uh, it's all made out of just a simple box rib metal that's with custom trim around the uh, edges and the eaves and carefully coursed windows. Uh, this is the fire escape door. We put a, a concrete there so you know where it is. But just simple canopy, and just a simple figure towards the highway. There it is right there. Uh, like I say, a lot of our projects come with cows. So it's a simple figure. Here, there it is. So it acts as this kind of sacred face billboard towards, uh, towards the landscape. Uh, and then, you know, they looked at it and they were like, wow, God, this is what we expected. And I said, yeah, but I mean, I think it has everything you wanted. And the Father John said, well, yeah, it does. It's got the symbols and the colors. And he goes, it's, it's even got three can lights, you know, the Trinity, I mean, in the can lights. And I, I said, yeah. <laughs> And I said, I, I, he says, what's the canopy about? I said, well, that's a little bit of Corbusier. He goes, oh, I've heard of him. And uh, I said, yeah, everything goes better with Corb. Uh, so, yeah. So here's a cut, section cut through the narthex, Father John's office looking down, uh, a niche for St. Nicholas, their patron saint. Uh, this is the return air duct, which is out of Arkansas White Oak. has a channel uh, here filled with sand, and you put candles in, and you pick up a candle and go underneath the blood of Christ here before you enter in to the sanctuary. So very simple uh, and very, very modest. Again, $100 a square foot. Boom. And we cut one window into the back elevation for morning light. It's the east elevation. Uh, the uh, conostasis is made out of uh, steel angle iron, uh, simple uh, chairs. And that's it. That's all there is. And everything, all the cross sections, everything you hear is golden mean. There's Father John and his regalia. Uh, blue light coming in. It's really just a nice country space, right? One of the problems, though, that we ran into is that part of what they had to have with all the icons and all the symbols was a dome. And we could not put the dome on top of the building because of the existing metal structure. So they allowed us to put it into the plenum of the ceiling. The problem was is that they couldn't afford the fiberglass dome, this big dome we spec for them. And they were running out of money. Um, and their contractor, he, he said, look, I don't think I can be skilled enough to build a custom dome. I said, well, what are we going to do? He said, well, give me a couple of days. Let me think about it, and I'll, I'll figure something out. So a couple of days later, he came back. He said, listen, I've got this friend of mine in the mountains out in the country, about 20 miles from town, who's a metal worker, and he loves beer. So for a couple of cases of beer, he said, uh, we can get a satellite dish, and we can make our dome. And so that's what we did. We went out, we gave the guy the beer, we got the satellite dish uh, here, we skim coated it in plaster. It's its own natural lath. And then we jacked it up on the scissor lift here, and they have their dome. There you go. That's how we roll, right? And one of the building committee members was so excited uh, about this way of thinking. He said, I know where we can get a, a, a bishop's throne when he comes to bless our church. And uh, I said, Oh, great, where? And he goes, well, it's, I can get it for free. It's walnut. It's got crushed purple velvet upholstery uh, and cushions. And, and he says, I can get it for free. It's, it's a part of an ad campaign at a local liquor store. And I said, oh, that's cool. And he goes, well, one small problem. I don't know what we'll do with the embroidered CR on it. And I go, oh, wh what do you mean? He goes, you know, Crown Royal. I was like, oh, yeah. And about that time, Father John, who was listening in, walks over and very discreetly says, no, Christ the Redeemer. Get the chair. So, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's how we roll. So in 2013, um, we got a call from Elizabeth Henry, who's head of the AIA Awards and Honors uh, Committee, to inform us that this little building had won uh, a national AIA Honor Award. And she said, you know, we were really shocked by the budget on this uh, and the cost. So we began to do some research, and she said, what we've discovered is that this is the least expensive uh, building to ever win a National AIA Honor Award in the history of the program. 
and you know, made us feel really good inside because it underscored what we've been trying to do for the last 25 years is to demonstrate that architecture can happen anywhere, right, at any scale, at any budget, and for anyone. Thank you. I apologize for the few images that didn't, didn't happen. Something happened for me. Yeah, you're okay, good. Yeah. All right. There were actually a redoing of the project, so you're now going to post rationalize that. Okay, I can do that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, good. So uh, I know everyone's uh, anxious to get uh, to the reception. Yeah. Working, but maybe yeah. one or two questions? Yeah, a couple. Three, three in the spirit of things. Three. <laughs> yeah. Three in the spirit of questions. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's right. right. They're just outside the frame here. You can actually see them right there. We, we made a, a fence to go around it, and they couldn't build it. But yeah, but most of it's hidden. Yeah. And we, are you talking about diffusers or uh, coils? or? Yeah. No, it's done very discreetly for the most part. We, we, we're obsessed with not putting things on the building and you know meters and all that, so we try to find ways to hide them. Thought I saw He's scratching his head. Uh-oh, Will. Oh, uh, here it comes. <laughs> yes, that's right, right here. Oh, I was talking about a little bit uh, at uh, dinner table tonight, and I really, I feel like it really hinges on passion, a great deal of passion for it, and coupled with, which is the hard part, patience. Uh, passion and patience, I think, are really key. And I think uh, the third thing would be uh, uh, being attentive to the world around you, observation. And that comes through uh, making, drawing, seeing, uh, not just looking. And, and I think the other thing is traveling. I think the, the thing that's most stimulating uh, to many of us as architects is uh, this world within worlds uh, that you find when you go to other places. And, how those things can inform what you do. Uh, maybe not in literal ways, but certainly in analogous ways. And it really helps you. You know, the imagination has to be filled with something. Uh, you don't just in generate a stuff out of your back pocket. So filling your imagination and disciplining your imagination with an understanding uh, of the language of our discipline of architecture. There are thousands of years that help support that language. And getting familiar with that, I think, is, is really important. But you have to have the patience uh, and the passion to, to, to make it happen because it takes a while. Stunned into silence. Stunned into silence. Come on, you can go pretty naked. <laughs> yeah, I, I ran into a few of that this afternoon with the students. Yeah. Right. There's yeah. one. Take a crack at an embassy, maybe? Uh, an ex-president's home? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being serious. The we, current President Gill? Huh? The current President Gill? Oh, I'm not referring to that, no. We're one of our Arkansans. Our, our uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I think we'd love another shot at a, doing a church. I think those are pretty amazing things. And, you know, we did the best we could with the resources that we had here, and I think we did well, but wouldn't it be wonderful to start from scratch and really kind of rethink that? So that, that's something we look forward. Something a little bit more, again, that intersection of the, of the prosaic and the sacred and what would happen, yeah. So maybe a church, I, I saw one of the most wonderful churches I saw was in a mall in Japan. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, Kengo Kuma, I think, a church, and it's, you know that that would that you know that would be kind of interesting. So not just any church, but a church in a mall, that would be good. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Thank you all. I appreciate you coming. Yeah.
curtains are opening magically.